Thank you everyone for joining us this morning for our first keynote, which will consist of a moderated fireside chat followed by Q&A. Um, please feel free to use this event platform to submit and upvote any questions that you would like me to ask when we get to that section. I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Martine Rothblatt, Chairman and CEO of United Therapeutics, a biotechnology company she started to save the life of one of her daughters. The company offers FDA approved medicines for pulmonary hypertension and neuroblastoma and is working on manufacturing an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. Dr. Roth Rothblatt previously created and led SiriusXM as its chairman and CEO and launched other satellite systems for navigation and international television broadcasting. In the field of aviation, her Sirius XM satellite system enhances safety with real-time digital weather information to pilots in flight nationwide. She also designed the world's first electric helicopter and piloted it to a Guinness world record for speed, altitude, and flight duration. In the legal arena, Dr. Rathblatt led efforts of the transgender community to establish their own health law standards and of the International Bar Association to protect autonomy rights and genetic information via the international treaty. She also published dozens of scholarly articles and papers on the law of outer space, resulting in her election to the International Institute of Space Law and represented the radio astronomy community's scientific research interests before the Federal Communications Commission. She has a bachelor's, JD, and MBA degrees from UCLA, which in 2018 awarded her its highest recognition, the UCLA Medal, as well as a PhD in medical ethics from the Royal London School of Medicine and Dentistry. Her patented inventions cover aspects of satellite communication, medicinal biochemistry, and cognitive software. Thank you so much for being here, Martine. How are you today? I'm feeling really good. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be at a UCLA-sponsored event. We are so happy to have you. So to start, I'd like to talk about your career evolution. Um, your career journey is not what most people would call traditional. So how did you decide to get your JD MBA and then go on to found SiriusXM? Sure, it was kind of very organic. I started off first being accepted to the law school because it seemed on uh, the most direct path from my passion as an undergraduate um, in which my major was communication from the Department of Communications at UCLA. And as an undergraduate, I developed an immense passion for communication satellites. It seemed to me just kind of magical that we could put these machines you know, far out into space, um, in some instances, like a sixth of the way to the moon. And these uh, machines, which we call satellites, could connect um, billions of people on the surface of the earth. It seemed like such a magical technology. So I got super turned on to it as an undergraduate. And then when I began thinking about where, what were the opportunities to expand the potential of satellite communications, I was surprised to learn that a lot of the limitations were actually in the legal and regulatory field because there were only so many uh, locations to put satellites in specific orbits around the earth. And there were only so many radio frequencies that could be assigned to satellites without different satellites causing harmful radio interference to each other and ruining their programming. So it was a classic case of a global resource whose optimal development depended upon uh, a rational regulatory and legal structure that led me to want to continue at UCLA Law School, which fortunately had a specific special program called the Communications Law Program. So it just seemed very organic and natural for me to go as a UCLA Communication Studies undergrad onto the communications law program at UCLA. That's awesome. And so then how did you go from being a satellite communications expert to founding a biotech company focused on pulmonary arterial hypertension? So it wasn't at all uh, my expectation that I would take this course in life. Like I said, I had all my um, personal energy wrapped around um, satellite communications and, um, 
and uniting the world with this kind of nervous system of humanity uh, based in space. And then out of the blue, uh, while I was running Sirius XM, our youngest daughter um, suddenly couldn't walk up the stairs. Um, her lips turned blue. And to make a long story short, she was diagnosed to have a uh, always fatal condition, fatal, more fatal than breast cancer, like average survival was three years. There were no medicines approved for the condition and no um, drug companies were working on any medicines for it because it's what they call a rare disease, meaning that only uh, one in every few million people develop it each year. And if the people rapidly die, then it never gets to be very many people at all. So um, I was faced with uh, what I would call like um, a pure do or die situation. Either I did something to save my daughter or she would die. And when I weighed my passion for satellite communications against my love of my daughter, it was no, no contest. So I just threw myself into learning biochemistry, pharmacology, pulmonary physiology. And I said to myself, I have to find a way to use everything I've learned in my life from law school, from management school to save my daughter's life. Yeah, I'd like to dig a little bit further into that. What, what kind of challenges did you face through this transition from broadcasting to biotechnology and how did you navigate them? So, you know, some of the first um, problems were, I'm sure entirely of my own making, that I never took any biology courses at UCLA. <laughs> so, um, so I really just didn't know anything. I was, I mean, the last biology course I took was probably like in 10th grade. Okay, so I just didn't know anything. Um, I didn't take any chemistry classes because you didn't need to take those for my communication studies major. And you certainly didn't need to take them to get a law degree or an MBA degree. So I was super ignorant. And um, I mean, maybe in retrospect, that was a blessing because if I knew how much I didn't know, maybe I would have been scared to even try to save her life. But I didn't even know what I didn't know. I was just like totally stupid. And so I just began reading. And um, I had to start by reading, you know, the equivalent of like biology for dummies because I, I, I was a dummy. I didn't know anything. And then from that, I could read like the college anatomy book. And from that, I could read a college biology book. Finally, I knew enough to be able to read like peer reviewed journal articles dealing specifically with pulmonary medicine. There the problem is, was, was that I couldn't even pronounce the words. There's a lot of complicated multisyllabic words in medicine. I didn't know how to pronounce them. I know how to pronounce like business concepts, legal concepts, electrical engineering concepts, but things like, you know, um, traprostanol, which now it's one of our medicines that flows right off my lips. I couldn't even pronounce it. So when I went and tried to talk to people to help me, I, I sounded as much of an idiot as I was. <laughs> But fortunately, you know, there's like 24 hours a day and I don't need very much sleep. So, and I, and I had this TikTok, TikTok of my daughter's illness getting worse and worse that I just worked and worked and learned and learned until I learned enough to know what type of medicine was necessary. And then that also gave me the knowledge to search in the literature to see if any scientist anywhere had ever developed this type of medicine. I found that somebody had. And at that point, I was able to flip on my Anderson management um, skill set to say, okay, this is a licensing transaction. I need to persuade these people of what like the, the, the net present value of this molecule is huge. And they should start investing their resources in developing it. Wow. And so how did you actually get access to the drug to outlicense it? So I actually was not very successful in persuading any drug company, and especially the drug company that happened to own the patent rights to this molecule, to develop it. It's like, you know, it's the whole thing about doing like an NPV calculation, you know, as a, as a, you know, a management school student or MBA graduate is it all depends on your assumptions. And, you know, I um, was able to basically, you know, back figure the assumptions so that the NPV looked very attractive. 
Um, but, you know, drug companies are full of all kind of, you know, business development experts and strategy experts. And it's like, you know, no, we disagree with like all of your assumptions. They are like way too optimistic. If this was as good as you say it is, you know, we might have thought of doing something ourselves. And uh, they, they really brushed me off um, until finally I just kept bugging them. And I said, I'll buy the molecule from you. I'll give you 10% of all the money we ever make from this molecule. You don't have to do anything. I'll raise all the money. I'll do it all myself. Please just sell me this molecule. Yeah, and that's probably the best 10% deal they ever made, right? <laughs> that's what they said. That's what like their heads of uh, business development, heads of, of engineering. Um, I mean, although they thought this molecule was completely useless and they thought my business plan was like uh, pie in the sky, um, our company today has a $9 billion market cap. Um, we've generated billions of dollars in revenue from that molecule. We've paid the company Glaxo over a billion dollars just in license royalties for which they didn't have to do anything. <laughs> and uh, best of all, uh, my daughter is still alive and uh, healthy, taking medicine every day, of course, but she's still alive instead of dying. And um, I won't say better than that, but as good as that, instead of there now being just um, a few thousand people living with this disease and then quickly dying, there are now tens of thousands of people in the US and around the world who take our medicines and live you know, um, relatively normal lives. So it's been a, a wonderful success story that um, I'm just so grateful for. Wow, that is, that is so amazing to hear. And so as folks can tell from just listening to your bio, you are a pioneer, you're known to transcend boundaries. And so the theme of our conference this year is forward. Um, and in fact, you've actually said that one of your mantras is forwards. So how has this theme showed up throughout your life and career? Yes, thanks so much for that question. You know, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just pay um, some credit to the Anderson School of Management for a moment, because believe it or not, um, there's an adage that I learned um, in MBA school, which I have used, you know, countless times in business meetings on the theme of forward. And the people around the world, around the rooms usually act like it's like a revelation from the Buddha or something, you know, that I said something so profound. But what we learned in, it was in finance, actually, was that um, historical costs are irrelevant to future decisions. And, um, and of course, you know, if you just stop and think about it, that's totally true. If you're doing an NPV calculation looking forward, um, you really, what you've spent in the past is completely irrelevant. But human, human psychology always tries to like, well, I don't wanna like, you know, waste quote unquote, you know, my past efforts. So people are always looking backwards and people are always falling victim of what I call the first rule of holes, H-O-L-E-S. Like if you're in a hole, the first rule of holes is to stop digging. But if you look backwards, you're always digging, digging, digging a deeper you know, hole that you're not gonna get out of. If you look forward, you've got a fresh opportunity to make a fresh start and to try something different, to evolve. Nature always looks forward because it's always putting out like new you know, genetic variations that give a way to try something different going forward. So uh, my mantra is forward. Also, I'll say as like a student of history, when I look in the past, um, I see that for the vast majority of people, the vast amount of time, life was a lot worse in the past. It's not to say that we don't have challenges today uh, with hunger, with oppression, um, with you know, pandemics, with um, global warming, climate change, uh, risks of nuclear warfare, I mean, you name it, we have like tons of challenges. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are more people living better quality lives today, more concerned with the whole world as an ecosystem to try to fix it and take it forward than there ever were before. So that's why I call myself a futurist, which for me, looking forward is another way of being a futurist. That's amazing. Um, so we are running a little bit short on time, but before we open it up to audience q and I want to talk a little bit about how gender identity has influenced your life. So how did your transition from Martin to Martine happen? 
it happened gradually. Um, in my soul, I was Martine my entire life, but I was also aware that um, that coming out as an LGBTQ plus person would involve a lot of sanctions um, from society, um, could be sanctions from your family, um, being disowned, could be sanctions from your friends, being um, you know completely ghosted in every way. And it could be sanctions from society, such as being killed, murdered, uh, raped, all of which has happened uh, way disproportionately to my transgender and non-binary brothers and sisters. So um, being aware of all of that, um, I was scared to come out. And so it was a very gradual journey. And it really wasn't until I found um, the love of my life, uh, my soulmate and partner, Bina, um, who, as we talked openly, she was like, immediately, it really doesn't matter to me, you know, whether you live as a male or a female or non-binary, I'm in love with your soul. And souls are, by definition, transgendered. And souls aren't locked into a label or a category. So she really gave me the, the personal strength to begin coming out. Um, our children, we have four children. They actually added to that saying, you know, why are you pretending to be uh, Martin when your parents come over to visit? And they added me to my parents. And then it turned out I had all these fears for nothing because uh, my parents were 100% accepting of me as being an openly transgendered person. So I've had a much uh, easier journey coming out than um, many, many other people. And um, I would be, I, I do not want to belittle in any way the risks, the dangerous risks of not coming out. But there are also very dangerous risks uh, to like staying closeted, um, suicide, um, mental anguish, depression, loss of life's opportunity, loss of people who truly love you for who you are. So I think that the, the balance of the scales is strongly in favor of, of coming out. And I'm so happy that I'm out open as an LGBTQ plus identified person. That's so great to hear. And so you have led efforts in the transgender community to establish health law standards. So why was this important for you? Because um, as I came out, it was uh, very clear to, um, to people in the transgender community that you had to play a game to basically be, achieve your authentic body. The people who were in charge of the medical community was a very patriarchal structure, and it had been that way for decades. And in their view, if you wanted to come out as a woman, for example, you had to uh, meet with psychologists, and claim to be you know, a strongly heterosexual person. And um, you literally had to like show up you know, in, um, dressed in a kind of a male fantasy of a woman to, or in order to get their approval and their sign off that you could have uh, gender confirmation surgery or that you could have excess hormones. And the same thing was in the reverse of people transitioning female to male you know, they had to come out as strongly heterosexual. And so me and my transgendered friends that were meeting, you know, we were saying like, this is, you know, this is totally wrong. Uh, this is awful. Um, we didn't like, you know, spend the first half of our life in the gender closet just to then spend the second half of our life in somebody else's gender closet. Mm -hmm. So we decided to take charge ourselves for the medical treatment of transgender people. And that's what led to the transgender community's own health law standards. Wow, yeah. So for our audience members who are out here, how can we be better allies to marginalized groups within the LGBTQ plus community? Well, the allies are absolutely essential for us. And I would say that today in you know, 2021, the transgender healthcare community is overwhelmingly populated by strong allies. And, you know, I'm just going to, you know, shout out, you know, a couple of names, just one, for example, Dr. Rachel Bluban Langer is the head of the Gender Identity Center at uh, NYU, an amazing ally um, with a team of uh, LGBTQ identified persons. 
The U University of Southern California has an amazing gender identity center, as is the uh, LGBT uh, center of um, Los Angeles up in like, you know, the Hollywood area. So um, allies are essential for us. I mean, for I would say that like the chain of strength that keeps all of us together is forged of the of the steel that comes from allies. So for all of the allies to just, you know, accept us as our as we are, not to presuppose um, stereotypes, not to presuppose labels, uh, respect the pronouns that we choose to um, identify with us, express ex, um, respect the non-binary nature of us that we don't want to like flip into one category or another. But um, I will say that the allies to the LGBT community have never been stronger, have never been more powerful, and have never been loved by all of us in the community more than they are today. Thank you, Martine. Thank you. One final question before I open it up to the audience for Q&A. What advice would you give to anyone who is struggling with being their true authentic self? I think it's the most important thing is to network with other people that can help you. Um, there are, you know, I mentioned a couple of resources in Los Angeles, New York. There are, are similar resources throughout the country. There are great resources online. If um, anybody is, is at the, the dark end of the continuum contemplating suicide, Kate Bornstein, who is one of the pioneers of uh, gender identity, she uh, runs a, a nationwide um, hotline type of service for people to discuss things. So reach out to, to other people together, we are stronger. And, um, and also trust your sense that the person or persons you're reaching out to uh, do not seem to have your best interests in mind, then shy away because there will be other people. There, there is no um, absolute shortage of good people in the country, but that doesn't mean that there aren't also uh, a lot of bad people in the country. So they are. Um, find an ally, find another person in our community that you trust and together reach out for more and more resources. Network in our community the way you would network in a business. Oh, I like that. That's, that's powerful. I'm sure that resonated with many people watching. Um, so we have a lot of questions coming through. Our uh, most upvoted question right now is from Elaine Hagen. And she's asking, looking forward, what's next for Martine? You have tackled some pretty big challenges in your career. Is there another challenge ahead? My greatest challenge right now is to continue doing, you know, the best possible job I can as the uh, CEO of United Therapeutics, the, the company that um, I work at right now. We have like an amazing team of people. Um, and um, I'm just, I just feel so proud and happy I feel literally 100% self-actualized just to be at United Therapeutics. A couple of the amazing projects that we're working on right now is to create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs, kidneys, hearts, lungs, livers. I, I feel a deep sense of injustice in my heart when I know that there are people that need a kidney or need a heart and either they die waiting for it on the organ transplant list or even worse, uh, they are not even put on the organ transplant list. Um, sometimes for, you know, perhaps medically valid reasons. Other times I would say for reasons that are ultimately born of systemic racism and systemic classism um, in both this country and other countries around the world. So to me, the best way to solve that problem is to create an unlimited supply of organs so that there are kidneys, hearts, and lungs for everybody. I am 100% confident that we will be able to succeed at doing that at United Therapeutics. So we're, we're working on that day in, day out. We also have new medicines. Uh, we just received an approval from the Food and Drug Administration earlier this month for a type of pulmonary fibrosis that had uh, no approved FDA treatment before. Uh, about 30,000 people were dying from it. So I love developing new medicines that can help people. We also support like what I would call like naturopathic type of um, therapies, such as there's um, a, a really exciting therapy called um, vagal nerve 
tact stimulation where you put like a device on your earlobe, which taps into the vagal nerve that comes out in the earlobe. And that's able to balance the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems in your body. So I love supporting these kind of totally naturopathic uh, medical systems. And finally, in our company, we have a very strong ethic of a zero carbon footprint ethic. Our, our, our view is that you could do the good thing and the right thing at the same time. Clearly, the good thing is helping people live longer and get over their diseases. But the right thing is to do that with a zero carbon footprint so that the whole world can be a healthier and safer place. So all of these organs that we're manufacturing and delivering, we're uh, trying our hardest to deliver them all with new types of aircraft, like you mentioned in the introduction, that are electric zero carbon footprint aircraft. Our headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland is the world's largest zero carbon footprint building. It, it actually generates more energy than it uses. So these are the passions that keep me going. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but I got a lot of passion. <laughs> no, that's that's wonderful. So continuing the trend of intellectual curiosity and, and pioneering. Um, <laughs> so our, our next question is from Lisa. And her question is, clearly your UCLA education has contributed so much to your success. Do you have any thoughts or even plans to help increase access to higher education for those of whom uh, college or post-grad is out of reach? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's something that um, is really shocking to me and I think is really, really wrong um, how much uh, higher education costs. Um, I will say that um, so far, the most that I have done in that regard is virtually nothing, which is simply voting for and supporting Bernie Sanders because he said, you know, um, you know, free college for all, which to me is no giveaway. It's just purely, I can't think of anything that's more in the self-interest of a society than helping to develop, you know, the minds of all the people living in that society. So, you know, there's, you know, if we can spend like, you know, a trillion dollars on weapons and, you know, a trillion dollars on subsidies for corn and whatnot, um, trillion dollars on building highways, why can't we spend like a trillion dollars giving like, you know, free college education um, for everybody who wants this at minimum public education, uh, which is of course the, you know, University of, of California system. So I'm not an expert in this area. You know, it's, it's pretty far afield from what I do. But um, if anybody wants my opinion, if anybody wants my vote, if anybody wants my donation, um, they have to be a uh, organization or entity that supports uh, free access to public education for everybody in America. Yeah, no, that's that's great. So our next question here, um, I think it's actually anonymous, uh, anonymously submitted, but the question is, looking at your impressive background, you've achieved so much and transcended barriers. Instead of sitting back and basking in the glory of your successes, what keeps you going? How do you find your fuel? Um, I, I, it's, it's, I don't have to look, really. I mean, it's like, to me, this is what I love doing. It's the most exciting thing to me about life is like hanging out with other people and working on a goal together. That's, that, is, that to me is like the most exciting thing to do. So uh, whether it's like building an electric helicopter, uh, figuring out a way that like, you know, all the architects and builders said, no, you cannot have a zero carbon footprint, 100,000 square foot building in the middle of a city. And it's like, you know, yes, we can, you know, you know, like the Obama thing, you know, <laughs> and figuring out a way to do it and working together as a team. It's a little bit harder to do that all virtual during the pandemic. But, you know, fortunately, you know, we're like almost at the end of that. And at least we have kind of figured, figured out, you know, remote and virtual, you know, team building or developing new medicines. It's, it's, you know, working as a team. My favorite thing to do is just like walking around the, the laboratories and the hallways of uh, different United Therapeutics buildings, talking to everybody I bump into and just saying, you know, what are you working on? What do you want to do? You know, you have any questions? Let's, let, let's figure this out together. So if I could have a thousand years of life, I would spend every single one of those years just hanging out with um, good people working as a team to make the world a better place. That sounds like a fantastic goal. 
Um, we have a couple of minutes more. Um, so the next question that we have here um, is asking, has there been any forward movement on the robot version of yourself that you built? Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, to be a little bit more accurate, it's actually a robot version of my partner, Bina. So uh, the robot version is called Bina 48. It has gone through uh, a number of different upgrades, uh, both in terms of its cognitive capability, as well as the uh, micro mechanical machines that uh, move her lips and cheeks and everything to mimic the natural expressions that, uh, that Bina has. So it is continuing to advance. Uh, we have a uh, website where you could uh, visit it. It's called lifenot.com, kind of like astronaut, but uh, lifenot, L-I-F-E-N-A-U-T, lifenot, and keep up with it. But um, uh, Bina 48's done TEDx's, I mean, continuously on the road, inspiring people. What makes me most happy of all, though, is that now there's like last count over 100 different um, open source groups working on their own kind of Bina 48s. And that was our real goal was to inspire young people, and I'd say especially young uh, women, to get into robotics and to, um, and to basically um, tackle things like cognitive computing and artificial intelligence to create a better world for everybody. Wow, yeah, really bringing the, the future to the present. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So our next question is from Caroline Anderson. And her question is, dangers still exist for trans people as well as women trying to advance in careers and society, but it must be less challenging than it was. Who do you see on the horizon today poised to achieve the kinds of astounding things you accomplished? You know, I, I wish I could say it's less less challenging and less dangerous than it was, but I I, I don't know that I could say that. Um, in a sense, the more of us who try to challenge the you know ensconced um, you know white cisgender patriarchy, the the more of us that are going to get um, beaten and 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 oppressed in some way or another. Um, the number of suicides, murders uh, among transgender people are actually right now at a record high. Um, the number of women who are um, raped, not to mention just you know sexually harassed to the point of being harassed out of their jobs and their career and their lives um, is probably at a record high right now. So, um, and that's, and then the number of people who are like BIPOC people that are just getting shot, killed, spat on, punched in the face. Um, you know, it, it seems like it's at a, at a record high. So I really can't say that, um, that things are better. What I, what I can say is that thanks to the efforts of allies, there are more people speaking out against the outrages that occur to the you know communities of color and communities of uh, gender and communities of sexual orientation, there are more people speaking out against the outrages of that than ever before, and I am so grateful for the efforts of our allies doing that because, of course, the allies have a disproportionate voice in the society overall. Amongst um, people right now, there there are a lot. I couldn't possibly like name all the amazing. Uh, LGBTQ, non-binary um, people that are rising in careers um, at companies throughout the country and organizations. I think, you know, one of my favorite organizations is called, um, it's an organization run by a person named Leanne Pittsburgh called Lesbians Who Tech. And uh, um, Leanne has organized over 100,000 people within a handful of years, all lesbians who tech, to network and um, help each other in their jobs and in STEM activity for younger people. So to me, um, you know, uh, Leanne is an amazing hero. That's amazing. This actually ties in really well to what I think I'm gonna make as our last question. Um, so 
Catherine asks, as a fellow trans woman who is rebooting her career, I'm wondering if you know of any trans-focused professional networking associations or other resources in an effort to build a strong community. Hmm. So the, the organizations that I'm most familiar with, there is one called um, TDLEF, uh, the Transgender uh, Defense and Legal Education Fund. Um, so this organization is out there um, looking for um, protecting the, the legal rights of transgender and non-binary people throughout the, the United States. That's a super good organization if one is sort of like more in the legal area. Um, another somewhat you know, specific organization is, I don't remember the exact acronym, but the, um, the medical health community for setting the standards for treatment of, uh, of transgender people is now uh, very much, I would say, populated, if, if not dominated, by openly transgendered individuals. And um, there's a lot of opportunity for networking there in terms of uh, medical outreach and um, advancing the state of care and, and advancing accessibility of transgender treatments to, to everyone. Um, longstanding organizations like, you know, the Human Rights Campaign Fund, GLAD, um, these, are, these are not exactly professional organizations for transgender people in particular, but they are organizations that, uh, while once kind of exclusive, uh, excluding of transgender people, um, are no longer exclusive, excluding and really embrace our issues and our causes and and help us. So I do think by networking through organizations that are essentially civil rights, human rights organizations for the LGBTQ plus community, that we would then reach out to other more transgender specific organizations. Like there must be an organization of like, you know, um, co of like transgender people who code. I mean, it's not called that to be like too lame. But, um, you know, there be organizations such as those. I'm personally not aware of them. But if you can't find one, create it. It's like this great saying, um, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. Mm -hmm. I love that. I've actually never heard of that one. Yeah, but that's a great one. I got it from my daughter, actually. So. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's a, that's a great way to end this segment. segment. But um, Build a door and move forward through the door. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we're throwing forward into every single phrase we can. <laughs> thank, you so uh, well, much. thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions as well as interacted and upvoted questions. And Martin, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us here today and, and be so open with us today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Happy to be with everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Martin. Um, so we now have a 15 minute break before programming continues with panels at 1125. Um, during this break, I am very excited to introduce our next Energizer leader, um, Juanita Caldwell, who will be leading us through some stretches that are good for sitting in front of the computer and working from home like we all are doing right now. So Juanita has bachelor's and master's degrees in sports administration, sports business, and sports media, and began her career in college athletics. She then made the transition to professional sports working in the NBA, and after a couple years in professional sports, she took a leap of faith and moved across the country to join us here in Los Angeles, California. She has followed her journey into a lifestyle of fitness, which led to the creation of Knit Fit, a fitness company created to cultivate and inspire healthier lifestyles by connecting people through our communities to make fitness a priority. Through Knit Fit, Juanita offers training plans uniquely created for each individual through both personal and group training classes. Her main goal is to help clients feel completely comfortable and empowered in their bodies and minds through fitness. So with that, take it away, Juanita. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for that awesome intro. Um, it is so great to be here. I am a thousand percent a true believer in living in your own purpose. And I just jotted down the note, if the opportunity doesn't, if the opportunity doesn't knock, then go to door. I love that quote because that's exactly what I did. Um, coming out to California and just taking a leap of faith and you know, doing what I'm doing now is exactly why I am in the space that I'm in today. Just 
building that door for myself. Um, the next door that we're building in this chapter is learning how to work from home. This has become the new norm. Uh, some of us love it, some of us hate it. And I think, you know, it's gonna be around for a lot longer than some of us may care to love about it. But one of the greatest things is just learning how to create in that space and learning how to make do with what we have. Um, you know, we're at a desk all day, sitting down, we're hunching over our keyboards and it's just so bad for our bodies. So today it's all about just kind of finding those ways to still get some movement in, still get those stretches in, all we're working from home, all we're glued to a desk or a computer screen all day long. So this is my little flow that I like to go through. So you guys can follow along with me. Um, we're gonna go from a sitting stretch, and then a few standing stretches, and then we'll end with a little uh, another standing or sitting stretch, just to kind of flow through and get our bodies loosened up and cramping out a computer screen all day. So we're all first sitting in our chairs. First, what I like to do is just to place my hands on my knees. I'll slide my screen back so you can see full. I'll place my hands on my knees. From here, I'm going to crunch my shoulders over and roll them back. Crunching my shoulders over, rolling them back. We're loosening up our shoulders. When we're sitting at a desk all day, we tense up and we're so nice and tense that we don't realize we're here all day. So it's good to relax your shoulders all the way down. We're going to roll them forward and back. And this is good to do while you're sitting down, while you're standing up, when you're sending emails and you're cooking dinner. Next, we're gonna do some neck rotations. So I'm gonna bring my right ear to my right shoulder, back to center, left ear to my left shoulder. I'm gonna flow through this a few more times. When I stretch, I love to have the silence. A lot of people, you know, you have different, different minds of what, of what works for you. Some people love to have music blasting. Some people love to have, you know, sounds of the ocean playing. So whatever you're doing when you're doing your stretches, feel free to have some music, some ocean sounds, or just some silence. Next, we're gonna bring our chin down to our chest. And then take our heads to our back. All the way forward. We're gonna go six more times here. Awesome, now I'm gonna take my hands to assist my neck. So my hands are now here, I'm gonna push my neck forward, trying to reach past that comfort level to really get that good stress in my, out of my neck. We're straining our necks all day long, starting at the screens. Now we're gonna push our chins forward, all the way back. Same thing, out of that comfort level. Now we're gonna pull our heads to the side, nice and gently when you come to the side. Some of you might be fortunate enough to get a good crack in. Now we're gonna to pull to the other side, nice and gentle. I'm pushing my chin up with my bottom fingers and pulling my head towards my shoulder. Awesome. Now I'm gonna take my fingers, I'm gonna turn this way so you can see. I'm gonna lock my fingers behind my back. Once my fingers are locked, I'm gonna roll my shoulders all the way back to open up my chest. And we're just gonna sit here. We slouch all day long. We don't realize that we're supposed to be sitting up straight. Something great that works for me. If any of you have a yoga ball at home, yoga balls are amazing to sit on and to do work on. It forces you to fix your posture when you're sitting and also alleviate some pressure in your lower back. Now from here, we're gonna roll those shoulders forward. I'm still keeping my fingers locked. Drop those shoulders down, relax for a second. Now we're gonna come right back up and over. Nice and wide open up. Can bring your head all the way down, chin up to the sky. Turn your right back down. Let's do one last one, relax. And one more, open up nice and wide. And bring it back down to center, awesome. Next, while we're sitting still, and these are all stretches that we can be doing in the middle of an email, in the middle of a meeting with our camera off, things that we could be doing just to make sure that our bodies are protected. Still sitting down, I'm gonna grab my right arm with my left hand. I'm gonna place my left hand on my right shoulder. I'm gonna pull my arm all the way across my body, really stretching and lengthening that arm out. Then I'm gonna take the same hand and wrap it around my neck. Awesome. It is focusing us, forcing us to focus on that flexibility in areas that we don't really use that often. I'm gonna shake it out, shake it out, switch over to the other hand. Same thing, that right hand now goes on that left shoulder. I'm pulling past that comfort zone, really getting that good stretch. 
pulling it all the way through my deltoids. Now I'm gonna take my left hand, bring it around across my neck, and I'm gonna continue to stretch and pull here. Awesome. I'm gonna take my hands, I'm still sitting down. I'm gonna take my hands, I'm gonna bend all the way forward and reach for my toes. Once my hands are locked under my toes, from this position, I'll slide back some. So we can see from this position, I'm gonna take my hands, lock them under my toes. I'm gonna then pull against my toes to stretch in, to strengthen and stretch my back out. So I'm pulling against my toes and I'm hunching my back forward to really stretch that lower spine. And then I'm gonna relax and come back down. And I'm gonna pull forward again. Relax and come back down. We're gonna go two more times. And relax, last time. And relax, awesome. Next one, we're gonna kind of rotate our lower back a little bit. I'm going to take my right hand, place it inside of my right knee. My left hand is just on my knee for support. I'm gonna press my right elbow against my right knee, opening up my back. Oh, I got a good little crack in. Hope you guys get a good crack in too. I'm gonna stretch that back up nice and wide. Once again, my right elbow is pushing against my right knee. My left hand is just my left knee for that support. We're opening our back all the way out. We're gonna come back to center, shake it out, shake it out. Then we're gonna switch. Left elbow goes to left knee, right hand on right knee. We're gonna get that other side. Awesome. All right. So those are for our sitting stretches. There's a lot of things we can do while sitting at our desk, sitting at that chair in the office. Next, we're gonna move it over to our standing stretches. So I'm just gonna slide my makeup chair out of the way. For our standing stretches, you can use the back of your chair if your balance isn't that well. So I will pretend like this is the back of my office chair. You can hold this for support. We're gonna grab one leg at a time. We're gonna work on those quads. Sitting down all day, your quads and your hamstrings are just not getting the movement they need to get. So they're sitting there, they're super tense, they're super tight. So we're gonna work on stretching those calves out, stretching those quads out, and stretching those hamstrings out in these standing stretches. I'm gonna switch over to that other leg. And if you wanna work on your balance at the same time, that's for stretching, but it's always an opportunity to work on our balance. You engage your core, once your core is engaged, that gives you a little more balance and a little more stability. So you can work on your balance, engaging your core, or you can use the back of your chair to hold for that support. Awesome. Our next one that we're gonna do, we're gonna go into a hamstring stretch. I wanna take my left leg, my heel is down, my toe is pointed towards the sky. You can also hold that chair for that support as well. And you're gonna reach down for your toe as far as you can go. If you can grab your toe, go ahead and grab your toe and pull yourself to your body. And if you can't grab your toe, you're gonna to go as low as you can comfortably, feeling that stretch all the way from your quad, from your calves, up through your hamstring into your glutes. Awesome, we're gonna switch on over to the other leg. Once again, I'm sitting that heel down, my toe is facing up. I'm also shooting my hips back. So I can really get, take advantage of that full stretch. I'm reaching for that toe. If you can't grab that toe, reach as far as you can. Beautiful. Next up, we're gonna go just into some calf raises. So from here, I'm gonna hold onto the back of my imaginary chair, and I'm gonna pedal my calves. Getting a nice movement, pedaling those calves out. You're stretching and you're strengthening your calves in this movement. All right, after we stretch those calves out, we're gonna grab that back of our chair. We're gonna do what's called almost a standing cat cow. So if you're familiar with yoga, you've done this on the mat plenty of times. We're gonna do a similar thing, but now we're just gonna do it from a standing position. You can hold the top of your chair or your desk or any flat surface. And from here, we're gonna push our back out. Like we're doing a big, big, big motion out, trying to make a big round in our back, pushing our back out. And then every three seconds, we're gonna switch and come different directions. So now I'm gonna push my hips up for a big arch in my back, 
A head goes up, really stretching it out my spine, stretching out my spine. Then we're gonna come up. If you want, you can come to your toes as well. This is a great, great calf stretch of it as well. And then back down. If you want to come to our calves one last time. Awesome. All right, so next we're going into, you don't need your chair at all. So for this, we're going to start up nice and tall. We're going to go out to a nice big star, as I like to call it. From here, we're going to shift our shoulders back. Our thumbs are up. We're really opening up that chest. We're seriously to hunching over here. We don't get any motion really out here. So we're going to open up that chest. Our thumbs go up. Legs are outside of our hips. We're going to strengthen that core and keep it all engaged. And we're rolling our shoulders back. I like to let my head drop when I do this one. Now we're going to bring our thumbs and bring our palms forward. Just small, subtle circles. Awesome. Next up, we're going to take the same start position. We're going to go opposite arms, opposite leg. So I'm going to bring my right hand down and over to my left leg. I'm reaching towards the outside of that left foot so I can really feel that stretch. Not only my hamstrings, but I'm also feeling it open up in my glutes, or in my, excuse me, my groin as well. I want to stand back up to the top and we're going to switch to the other side. Reach into the outside of that leg. If you can grab your toe, once again, grab your toe over that toe. If you cannot grab the back of your calf and work on pulling yourself closer and closer, we're going to go two more each side. All right, we're going to hit that neck one last time. This time we're going to go swings all around. We're going to go neck rolls all around. You're going to go from right to left. And then left to right. You can do a full circle. We can go half circles. Awesome. It's so great to get the chance, if you have standing desk, or if you have something that you can prop your laptop or computer up on, to bring your device eye level. Hunching over all day is so bad for our spine, so bad for our necks. So it's a good habit to get into of bringing your item eye level. Even with our phones, we're so used to looking down at our phones that our necks are being strained all day. We have to get in the habit of bringing it to our eye level. And once we get in the habit of doing that, we're building a stronger spine, we're building a stronger neck, we're, getting, we're engaging those muscles and not stressing and straining them all day. Our last one, we're going to work on those arms. We're going to have my palms down, my right hand palm is down, my left fingers, I'm going to take and grab across the top of my right fingers. I'm going to press all the way down. Getting this good stretch right here in my arms. You're cramped up with typing emails all day. Try to strengthen and stretch those arms out. And now I'm going to take that same arm and do the opposite push against it. I'm going to flip my hand inward. My palm is now facing in. I want to grab my fingers and push, 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 push towards the opposite. There we go. Everyone switch to the other hand. Palm out. I want to grab those fingers, pull it apart. And palm in. I'm going to pull against those fingers. All right. And our last one, I always like to end with some sort of full body stretch. So we're going to go into a fold. You're going to fold your body completely in half, as low as you can go. If you can grab those toes, go for it. If we can grab your calves, go for it. If you can grab your hamstrings, go for it. We're going on as low as we can go. From here, we're releasing all that stress. We're putting in good energy. We're going to roll those shoulders back. Take a couple deep breaths. We're going to roll up nice and slow, one vertebrae at a time. Your neck will be the last to roll up. Once we get to the top, one final neck circle. Awesome. And in yoga, as they would say, namaste. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, Juanita. I I feel looser already, and I'm definitely going to keep these with me during Zoom classes, so thank yeah, you. Absolutely. I always will have my camera, like, pause or something when I need to. I'll stand up, do my stretches, and then get right back into it. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, well, thank you so much. Um, so we are running about five minutes behind. So if all of you could um, join your panel breakout sessions, please navigate to the My Schedule tab and join your panel. Uh, if you did not register for a specific panel, or if you'd like to switch, you can see your options on the All Sessions tab and go ahead and join whichever is of interest. We'll see you there.